Good afternoon. How is everybody today? Good. I see we're, I beg your pardon? Well, it's nice to be back here. Yeah, it is. And I understand we're, beg your pardon? Yeah, you got, I was just going to say, it looks like, uh, although I don't know, they're saying, I don't know, maybe we're going to, we're not going to get it that bad, I guess. I don't know. It's up the line, I hear they are. Uh, they're going to get they're going to get slammed up the line, I suppose. But uh, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> but maybe that's the last gasp. Is it supposed to be in the 40s? I guess for the rest of the week. It's supposed to be 40 tomorrow. 40 in the 40s tomorrow. Anyway, tonight I guess into tomorrow morning. So no, uh, we'll see. Uh, you know that being an economist, you can be wrong half the time and still have your job. Like the weatherman, those two. Anyway, uh, this is a uh, obviously a new series, Politics of the Dollar. Uh, there's a lot, I suppose there, this can be pretty controversial, I guess. Uh, you know, the use of the dollar in foreign policy, part of, which is part of this. Although, uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to go back a little farther than I originally intended because I want to build a base here. The importance of money in the growth of the American, growth of America, or the founding of America. Uh, so I'm going to lay that base today. And then next week, I'm going to get more into uh, something I like to call financial imperialism. I'll give you an idea where that's going. Uh, but today, a good place to start is how about even before the American Revolution? You know, as, as after the French and Indian War, and those of you who've attended earlier lectures, you know, the, the, you know, the British Crown had to borrow too. I mean, this is the power of money here. The British Crown had to borrow. And what's interesting here, you know, when, when you look back at the French and Indian War, which, which is really part of the Seven Years' War. Some people call it the Seven Years' War. Some people call it the French and Indian War. Here, really, it's the French and Indian War. But it's also part of a war the British and French are fighting in, in, in India. Uh, you know, and Winston Churchill stated that this was the world's first world war. Uh, I don't know about that one. But it's for control of India as well as it is for control of land here. Here we go again, land. And in, eight, in 1757, uh, the stationing troops here in the North American colonies for the British cost them 70,000, cost the British taxpayer 70,000 pounds. By 1763, when the war is over with, try 350,000 pounds. That's a lot of money by comparison to seven years earlier. It goes up five times. And so since the British crown has to borrow from the bankers, don't they have to pay it back? Yes. And so it's, it's, it, you know, the idea becomes prevalent here in England that, well, if we have troops stationed in, in, in the colonies, shouldn't the colonists themselves pay for some of that? Okay. And that leads to what? The Sugar Revenue Act in 1764? Well, that's going to come, yeah. Uh, the Sugar Act, and then, and then and the, you know, these are fo it's followed by various acts after this. And so the, the Crown is looking to use the colonists to raise money, to pay for stationing troops here, to the point where, uh, you know, by, by, by the Quartering Act, you know, the, the, the Coercive Acts, or the Intolerable Acts, as they're known, uh, e even to the point where they don't want the colonists taking any more land because they have to station troops in the outback to protect the colonists. Well, how do you defray your costs? You defray your costs by pulling the troops out of the, out of the countryside and sticking them in the cities, which is what the British are going to do. Places like Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Charleston. But then again, when they do that, the colonists can start rising up in locales in the outback and push out crown-appointed administrators. But to me, that's, that's part of this, you know, the issue of land. The other, to me, one of the biggest boosters, one of the biggest boosters for revolution, and Ben Franklin uh, uh, testifies to this, is the Currency Act of 1764. 
I mean, keep in mind, as, as the economic prospects for colony, the colonists begin to decline here, they want to print their own money. They had done this before. But there's nothing backing up the money. But some of the colonists had actually had a, had, had a pretty good hand on what they were doing. You know, you print out this money. It's really not backed by anything. But then again, this is for their own economic interaction. But then again, if the crown is raising taxes to pay back the banks, how are they going to pay back the banks with worthless colonial script? The bankers aren't going to take this. So what, are the, so what, are the, what, are the, what does the crown have to pay the bankers with? Gold and silver. That's what the bankers want. However, with the Navigation Acts going back to the 1750s, it was forbidden to export gold and silver to the colonies. Well, then how are the colonists supposed to pay off, supposed to pay their taxes? How's that supposed to work? How is that supposed to work? So, for their own purposes, they're printing up their own money. Now, that's, that's, again, this money isn't worth that much, but some of these colonists seem to know what they're doing. You know, if you have a lot of economic interaction, you print more paper money. If inflation results, what do you do? You cut back on the money supply. But again, the crown can't pay off the banks with this money. And so in 1764, what comes out of the crown? What comes out of parliament? No more. You can't print your own money. You know, when you tell people they can't control their own money and they can't have access to land, they're liable to get, to get a little miffed especially when their prospects begin doing. Ben Franklin stated that this was one of the major reasons for the revolution. It's nice to be going to school and you're taught liberty, freedom, so on and so forth, but let's get down to the building blocks here. Money, land, that's economics. That's economics. You're, you're, part, of, part of the reason you're going to have a country is based on the fact the founders like the idea of owning property. Well, doesn't sometimes owning property mean you have, have, to, have to have access to money? Yeah. Doesn't, is, is, isn't land, isn't land sub, subject to fluctuations in value? And doesn't that affect money? Vice versa? Yes. Well, during the American Revolution, what are the... Con and keep in mind here, you know, this is a loose confederation here. Many of these colonies have their own agendas, especially when you get into the differences between North and South. And that's going to, you know, that's going to grow. And so what are these colonies doing? They're printing their own money again. Again, during the war, is this money worth much? No, it's not. No, it's not. And so it, it, are, is, a sub, is there, are there is a, is inflation going on? Yeah, there is. And then, and then the Continental Congress, to raise an army, you know, eventually promises officers a half-pay pension for life. And soldiers are supposed to get paid. Keep in mind, many of these soldiers are what? Farmers. They're leaving their farms to join the Continental Army and to fight, and they're leaving the wife and the kids at home to run the farm. And you don't think some of the families at home are up against it economically? Yes, they are. So when the war is over, when the war is over, many of these soldiers hadn't been paid. That can lead to a problem. An army that's disgruntled, an army that's disgruntled, and this is going to lead to the, to the um, Newburgh Uprising in 1783, but we're really not going to go there. And, the, and George Washington puts down this so-called mutiny in the army, potential mutiny in the army. But then again, as the country is trying to dig its way out of this economic morass, you are seeing some of these colonies, prior to being states, trying to raise tax, and so many of these states are saddled with war debt. At the same time, they're raising taxes on the people who live in these colonies. Shays' Rebellion, 1786. That scared the hell out of the ruling, out of, the, out of, the, out of, the, out of the, what's going to be the ruling class here. Why? The people 
They don't want to pay the taxes. They don't want to lose the land. That rebellion will be put down, and Daniel Shays will escape Massachusetts and cross the border into Vermont. But Jefferson stated that message was delivered. We need to have a national government that will benefit the mass, or else we're going to have more of this. In fact, George Washington said this is an example of anarchy. And so in 1787, you'll see the Constitutional Convention, and they will agree to a republic. They don't want a democracy. Or as Madison said, a democracy is a dictatorship of the majority over the minority. That's what he writes in The Federalist. Or what will be the Federalist. Well, I mean, a simple expediency here. What democracy is what? For the mass, a republic is for what? An individual? The, indi the rights of the individual? That's what they wanted. But that doesn't... So it's nice to have a government like this. You have a Constitution and Bill of Rights. But how is this government supposed to function when it's technically broke? How is that supposed to work? You know, George Washington's first term in office. <laughs> the country is not on sound financial footing here. And who are they going to call on to fix that problem? Alexander Hamilton. Mr. Hamilton, who was one of George Washington's right-hand men during the war as an aide-to-camp colonel. He was an aide-to-camp colonel at age 22 for George Washington. And yet... He's going to be at odds with another young man who helps to form this country, uh, Thomas Jefferson. And, and then you're going to get, now you're going to, now you're going to begin to see, you know, the Jeffersonian idea, the agrarian view of the nation versus what Hamilton's going to put forth, the manufacturing slash financial view, a modern economy. But you can't have that unless you have what? Money. It's not going to work. And so he's going to be appointed Secretary of the Treasury. Treasury of what? A piggy bank? It has a lot of dust on it. He's going to have to dust it off. And so what he wants to do is this. He understands that this country has $51 million in debt. How would you like to face that debt with nothing in the piggy bank? And so 40 million of that debt is held by people who live here. 11 million is held by foreigners. What Mr. Hamilton wants to do here is, now keep in mind, you're, st you know, you're, you're, you're forming this country, the Constitutional Convention is over with. And so while this is being done, states are voting on the Constitution to be admitted as states. This is going on at the same time. You know, you're into 17, you're into 1789, 1790, 1791. But Hamilton has to solve the financial problem. And so what he wants to do is, he wants to get rid of all the old debt. He wants to redeem it at par or face value and have it replaced with new debt. Same value. However, he's going to run into he's going to run into roadblocks here. Apparently, many of the people here who had taken on some of this debt during the American Revolution, due to their economic and this happened to soldiers too, due, due to their economic circumstances, had to sell a lot of this debt below the face value. They needed money. They needed cash. So speculators bought up some of this debt. And they bought this debt at bargain prices. And if they're going to redeem this debt at face value, who makes the money? That's it, the speculators. Now, there's some in Congress who thought, okay, uh, okay, Alex, this is not a bad idea, but we need to make sure that some of the people, or, or all the people here who bought this debt and had to sell it, reap the returns. And what's Alexander Hamilton's response? No. Whoever holds the debt reaps the rewards. The speculators did not cause this economic problem. 
the war did. So whoever holds the debt is the one who gets the money. Now, if you're one who had that debt and you had to sell it because you needed money, you're not going to be happy here. In fact, even soldiers who took on, who, to, who invested in this debt or were given promissory notes by their colonies to be paid, sold off some of their promissory notes, and guess what they're going to get? Zippo. And so it's the people who currently hold the debt. And another thing Alexander Hamilton wants to do, he understands he's going to get a backlash here, especially from southern states. Keep in mind the situation here as this is progressing. The North, the North has most of the debt. Many of the southern, what are going to be states, have been able to pay off some of their debt. But the North holds 80% of the debt. The South, only 20%. So the North is really what's indebted here. So what is Hamilton proposing going to help the Northern interest? Yes, because what Hamilton, to get the Southerners on board states, okay, we're going we're to assume every state, we're going to assume the federal government will assume all their debt. The states will have no debt. The federal government will take their debt. That's to get all the states on board here. And so he says we will provide with this new, with, with the new issuing of the debt, new debt, we will provide a sinking fund that will go just to pay off the bills. And part of this are foreigners. And how's he help, how's he going to get the southerners on board? He's eventually going to make a deal with Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Because many Southerners don't want to do this. We've eliminated most of our debt. That's the, northern pro that's the northern states. That's their problem. And so what's going to be the compromise? Moving the nation's capital to the Potomac. Thomas Jefferson's going to later say, well, I was hoodwinked into this. Uh, no, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. And so the Southerner... and. Alexander Hamilton stated that with the capital moving to the Potomac, that the South will benefit economically. And so your capital will be set up in Washington, D what's going to be called Washington, D.C., eventually as a sop to the Southerners. Well, what do you think the Southerners are thinking? The capital at one point was in Philadelphia. Then it was in New York City. What's the biggest port in the, in the country? New York City, where did a lot of the slaves come through? New York City, where are the banking interests for the most part? Up in the north, how are the southerners supposed to feel? You got to give them something. You have to give them something. Alexander Hamilton also knew that getting rid of this debt needs to, you need to attract investors. And where are some of these investors going to come from? Overseas. And who's gonna and who's gonna redeem some of this uh, the debt for us? The British, the people we threw out of here. Also, at the same time, guess what's gonna happen here? A lot of investment in debt here is gonna be pe by people of means. And so, where are you going here? The wealthy will control the economy because they control the debt. Yes. Now, keep in mind the man who's doing this, Alexander Hamilton. He didn't trust the common man anyway. You know, Alexander Hamilton always gravitated toward the privileged. In fact, when they were putting together the voting scheme, remember the electors, or the electoral college, if you want to call it that? Alexander Hamilton said that the electors, you know, when you get back to the Constitution, it says in your Constitution, the electors are picked by the states. You have to have them, and that's as far as the federal government goes. But the states choose the electors. Now, keep in mind here, and I am always at odds with some of these people who say, well, we ought to get rid of the Electoral College. Of course you want to get rid of it because it's controlled by Democrats and Republicans. It was put together before there were parties. Of course, Hamilton states, again, in the, when he writes in the Federalist, 
that each state should pick from the most intelligent, most intelligent pool of voters those who will act as a check on the mass because Alexander Hamilton is of the persuasion that the mass does not think and therefore not as well informed. You need a check on the mass. But of course today, who picks the electors? Democrats and Republicans, right? Do you honestly think in this state Democrats and Republicans are picking the most intelligent people from the voting pool to be electors? They're going to pick party hacks. That's what they're going to do. Maybe a journalist who's favored to the Democratic Party. Maybe the Republicans will pick a local politician who's a real booster of the party. Well, that's, that's allowable. But don't think they're the smartest, don't think they're the sharpest tools in the shed intellectually. They cater to the party. Well, this is all put together before there were parties. And so Hamilton thinks that by going this route, he will, he will eliminate the debt of this country. Now keep in mind something else he wants. A central bank. What's the best way to protect the money? In a central bank. It's going to become the Bank of the United States. And so to do that and to help eliminate the debt, you're going to have to have a stock offering here. Now there are some people here, and you know, there's some people here who are do not go with a central bank. They're afraid of too much centralized control of finance. Because when the stock offering comes, guess what's going to happen? Ten million dollar stock offering to, sub to, to subsidize the bank. Eight million of that will be will be purchased by who? The private interests. And out of 25 directors of this bank, only five of the directors will be chosen by the new federal government. The rest will be private individuals. And so what did Hamilton do here? Did he turn the interest of the country financially over to the privileged interest? Yes. Yes, he did. But again, Part of, part, of, part of getting this bank approved was, again, that sop to the South. We'll give the capital, we'll put the capital in the Potomac, and that'll help the South. So it's interesting the politics he's playing at the same time he's trying to get rid of the debt. And guess what's going to happen here? That stock offering for the bank was sold out in hours. Now the country has a lot of money. The central government has a lot of money. And what's going to happen by 1795, 1796? The country will be virtually debt-free because of investors investing. In them. And that's another thing. People like Alexander Hamilton thought contracts were sacred. Your word to pay off debts, sacred. Alexander Hamilton, as a lawyer, you know, again, wedded to private property. The essence of our, one of the, one of the real essences of our revolution was private property. Not like when it's going to come down the road <laughs> about 50 years from now, 1848, when Karl Marx says what? Private property is the bane of the, sa of the wage earner because it's the capitalist who holds the property because his factory's on the property. That's not Ale In fact, Alexander Hamilton, being, you know, being a person who puts his money where his mouth is, will defend people who were of a loyalist or Tory persuasion who lost their properties. He will try to get that property back for them. You know, there were colonies here who just, well, you're a Tory or a loyalist, we're taking your land, and you're stuck with nothing. Well, Hamilton was of such that, of that, that persuasion, ownership of private property, that that was wrong. And he'll go to bat and defend them in the courts so that they get their property back. Of course, part of that is he didn't want those people, especially if they were people of means, he didn't want them to leave the country. That means they're taking the money with them. Well, he's not stupid. He's really one of the more interesting characters 
of, the, of early American history, despite the fact they'll get killed in a duel with Aaron Burr, one of the more doubtful characters in American history, Aaron Burr. So Hamilton helps to straighten out the country, but there is still, interestingly enough here, interesting here, when George Washington, you know, the, the, <laughs> the Congress will pass the bank bill. Washington doesn't sign it right away. You know, uh, Washington is waffling here. So he calls in the two people in the end that are going to help, help him make a decision. And that's Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson. Interesting what Hamilton says here. You know, the idea here is, you know, the question comes up, is the, bat is a, is the Bank of America constitutional? Does it say in the Constitution that, that Congress can erect a bank? No. And so, you know, very, keep in mind, they're very, very, they're very cognizant of the Constitution they've written. Hamilton defended the legality of the bank since, according to him, a logical connection existed between the purpose of the bank bill and the powers clearly stated in the Constitution. He wrote, the bill was constitutional. A bank has a natural relation to the power of collecting taxes, to that of regulating trade, to that of providing for the common defense. That's what, Je that's what Hamilton says. Jefferson disagrees. Congress could do only what the Constitution specifically authorized. The elastic clause According, to, according to, to, to Jefferson, granting it the right to pass all laws which are necessary and proper to carry out the specified powers must be interpreted literally. Or Congress would take possession of bound, a boundless field of power. So unless it's specifically authorized in the Constitution, no, we shouldn't have a bank. It's not, in other words, what Jefferson's saying, according to his rationale, it's not necessary. Hamilton is saying it is. Without it being specifically specified in the Constitution. Because the bank will help regulate or collect the taxes. A bank will help fund what? A standing army, perhaps? Interesting how interesting what's going on here, but at the same time, at the same time, this bank, which is going to hold deposits from what? The people? It's going to hold deposits from the people. But the people aren't going to make any money off it. Who's going to make the money on, on the interest on that money? The people who invested in the bank. And that's again who? The privileged. Interesting where that's going. Interesting where that's going. But you can't deny the fact that the country is now on a sound financial footing. And we have among the, one of the highest credit ratings in the world by 1796. This country was like the South Bronx in 1790. Now it's got one of the highest credit ratings in the world. In six years. Wow. But there are still people who don't trust paper money. You know, they're going to, they're going to issue banknotes here. And so as the country goes on here, you know, by, 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 the, by, the, by 18, 1815, 1817, they're going, to, they're going to recharter a Bank of the United States. And there are some people who do not want this central bank. They feel it's too much control, too much financial control in too few hands. This brings up the Marshall Court, John Marshall. John Marshall is a Hamiltonian in favor of manufacturing and finance. You know, the agricultural interests, okay. And so there are, and, and keep in mind here, with the formation of a national bank, state banks begin to pop up. You know, in 1791, 
there were only three state banks in the entire country. Of course, there's only going to be, you know, 13 colonies, 13 states. In 10 years, 32 state banks. Now, there is competition between the state banks and the Bank of America, which Bank of the United States, which wants to keep some sort of control over these banks by limiting credit. But then again, you have to extend credit because why? People are still moving. People are moving west. They want to buy this land. They want to, they want to own land. And so you begin to see a movement afoot to kill the Bank of America. And one of the states is Maryland. And Maryland passes legislation, it's interesting here, to kill the influence of what they call foreign banks, which they include the Bank of America here. John Marshall is against this. He's going to preserve the primacy of the Bank of America. And the bank will survive. Keep in mind, again, Marshall is for the industrialization and financialization of America. That comes out of the Marshall. That, that's, that accentuates what Hamilton wanted to do through the courts. This is called the McCullough, the McCullough versus Maryland decision of 1817, 1818. However, by the time of the Andy Jackson administration, now here's where it really gets dicey here. Uh, the, the man who, the, man, the chairman of the, of, the, of the Bank of America is Nicholas Biddle. He took over in 1826, he was around 37 years old, and he's from Philadelphia, which by the way is where the Bank of America is really located at this point. And so Nicholas, B Nicholas Biddle's a, 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 a fascinating individual. Uh, he was not only chief of the Bank of America, uh, he was also a lawyer, uh, was, was, had a wide variety of interests here. And he's controlling what the, you know, the lending that's going on by these state banks from the center. You know, they issue the bank notes, but they also, he, also has to, he also wants to make sure that these state banks or local banks have enough gold and silver to back up the paper money. He does not want an overburdening amount of lending here. But keep in mind, you know, this is, this, by 1830, 1832, the country's really starting to expand here. There is an insatiable desire for credit, especially to buy land as we continue to move west. Andy Jackson does not like the Bank of America. Now, Andy Jackson is still the, does not trust paper money. You know, it's gold and silver. He's still in that mold. And land is a sign of wealth. Of course, isn't Andy Jackson well off? And he was a Jeffersonian. He didn't trust the, he didn't trust the bank. He thought it was too much power at the expense of the mass. You have people's deposits in the central bank, and they don't get any interest off it. It goes to the privileged class. And where are the, a lot of the privileged who had invested in that bank? Up in the north. 1832 election. Henry Clay of the National Republican Party, who also is in league with Daniel Webster, uh, is going to try to make an issue out of this. You know, Nicholas Biddle is able to keep the country on a sound footing by controlling this insatiable desire for credit. He does allow credit, but he allows it to be done on an even keel so the country won't all of a sudden go broke, you know, inflation, so on and so forth. He keeps, he keeps a tight, pretty tight rein on this. And so, huh, Henry Clay understands that Jackson wants to get rid of the bank. And so, as and he, and Jackson had told Biddle, I don't trust your bank. I don't trust your bank at all. And I don't trust paper money. Henry Clay understands this. He wants to run against Jackson for the presidency. And as Jackson's hatred for the bank grows, Nicholas Biddle find well, Nicholas Biddle is being used here, too, by Henry Clay and the National Republicans. 
And so what does Biddle begin to do? He begins to make sure that loans favorable go to the National Republicans and journalists who also cater to that agenda. And what do you think Andy Jackson's going to do? You know, Jackson doesn't like being crossed. I often wondered what Jackson would have done. Remember when the, the few years back when the Bundys took that land in Oregon? I wonder what Jackson would have done with that episode. That would have been interesting. That would have been interesting. Jackson is now going to try to kill the bank. And he's, you know, the, the, it's the Secretary of the Treasury that has to draw the funds out of the bank. The President can't do that. I'm sure there's somebody in office right now who would like to be able to do that. And I'm sure there were others, if they were in that office, would like to be able to do that. And his Secretary of the Treasury is a man by the name of Louis McLean. McLean agrees with Biddle, though. He agrees with how Biddle is arranging the economy and financing in this country. And so what is Jackson going to do with McLean? Kick him out of his job and promote him to be Secretary of State. He brings in a man from Pennsylvania named William Duane, a lawyer, and he orders him to take the money out of the Central Bank, out of the Bank of America. I, you know, apparently maybe Jackson uh, didn't vet this guy properly. Guess what? Duane, Duane agrees with McLean and he agrees with Biddle. No, we're going to have to get rid of him. So he brings on the Attorney General to be Secretary of the, of, of the Treasury, Roger B. Taney, who's already been advising Jackson on this issue. Taney is under no illusions here. He's going to do what Jackson tells him to do. And beginning in 1832, Taney, all new receipts going to the central, going to the Bank of America will not go to the Bank of America. He begins to take federal funds and he's moving it into seven specially cho or specifically chosen state banks. And one of the state banks is the Bank of Baltimore. Now, some people have, you know, uh, some people uh, criticize Taney, although supposedly, according to some economists I read, that Taney did vet these banks before making sure they get the money, the nation's money. Of course, but the Bank of Baltimore stands out, and here you begin to see this idea of using. Some people are going to criticize uh, Jackson for picking pet banks. And of course, there is some validity to this because the Bank of Baltimore that Taney is going to put some federal funds into, he has stock in that bank. And also, he's good friends with the bank president. And so what he's doing is all new receipts going to the, Fed, going to the Bank of America will now be put into these banks and he will begin to draw funds out of the central bank, the Bank of America. And in the beginning of this crisis in 1832, in cash, get this, in cash, the Bank of America had $9,868,000. In four months, three, four months, it's down to four million. And so, since they're moving that cash, they're moving that money to these other banks. Uh, it's interesting here because by the time 1834, 1835, federal money is now in 90 banks. How hard is it to keep control of the lending practices of these 90 banks instead of having the funds or control with one bank? It's hard to do. Hard to do. And so, what else is going to happen here? It's fascinating to see. Land speculation starts. You know, Biddle made sure that Biddle made sure that there had to be the proper mix of gold and silver in these banks before he would issue banknotes or credit. Now, another now another problem is going to be the amount of silver. China is having a problem. They can't buy up Mexican silver. So where are the Mexicans going to send that silver? 
And so now these banks are going to have more silver and you know, the silver in their, in, their, in their bank troughs. And what's going to happen now with paper money? They're going to be able to print more paper money. And so what happens to lending? It's going up. And the lending gets out of control. Land, prices of land go up. Prices of commodities, where do they go? Up. Interesting here, when, interesting here when, when, when you take a look at this. Huh. This is fascinating. In 1835, money, paper money in circulation in January 1835 amounted to $82 million. By December 1836, $120 million. Land sales. Land sales are going off the charts. Get this, and this is, gonna la this is, this is not going to last. It's interesting. In 1832, the Bank of the United States, still in part regulating money, <laughs> federal income from the sale of land in 1832, $2.6 million. But notice how it takes off. 1834, the federal government made $4.9 million. In 1835, $14.8 million. In 1836, $24.9 million. The, the United States government found itself totally free of debt and had a $20 million surplus. But keep in mind what's behind this. Now, this 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 will this will really blow this will really blow, blow your socks off. In 1835, New York City, a city of a quarter of a million people, land had been bought and sold so many times that, that, it, it, that enough house lots had been laid out and sold to support a population of two million people. Chicago, you know Chicago only had two or 3,000 people at this point? Yet, believe it or not, yet most of the land for 25 miles around this village had been sold and resold for building lots. It's speculation gone wild. There's no centralized control here. Andy Jackson sees what's going on. And what does he do? He calls a halt to the lending in 1836. And what do you think happens to the price of land? What do you think is happening to commodities? What do you think is happening to crops? What happens to the economy? <laughs> and he kills the central bank. This country will not have a central bank until 1913 with the Federal Reserve. And so, you know, the, the country's money for the federal government will be dispersed among pet banks. But of course, if you want to call them pet banks, state, certain state banks, but who will control the money in essence? The northern banking interests. This will be one of the reasons you will have an American Civil War because most of the developed cities are where? In the north. You go to the south, you know, where you go to the south, plantations, but many people are what? Small farmers. They cater to the plantations. You don't have the urbanization in the south that you have in the north. So that alone is going to dictate where, is the finan where are the financial interests going to be? Up in the north. And again, New York City. New York City didn't want the central bank in Philadelphia. They didn't like the idea that Nicholas Biddle controlled the banking, controlled the, the nation's money from Philadelphia. Why? Well, New York City is growing into the largest, largest city in the country, and it's the major port. And another aspect of this is who collects the tariffs on incoming goods? It's New York. Where does the money get transferred? To Philadelphia. New York, New York bankers feel that should be the place where the bank should go. 
not Philadelphia. So they're going to support Jackson. Interesting how this is. This is absolutely fascinating. But you are seeing this, this dispersal of federal funds to certain banks in the states. But then again, what did this do with the speculation of land with no centralized control? Caused a collapse. Yes. Well, keep in mind, they are not really going, they're, they're going west, but they're not really far out west yet. And so they're moving, but it's not quick enough to grab all that land. I mean, keep in mind, you haven't had the Spanish-American War yet. You haven't had the Mexican-American War yet. Correct. Well, it's going you know, toward the Mississippi River, going beyond, but still. You still don't have that. It's a migration, but it's not the migration you're going to see after the Civil War or just prior to the Civil War. You know, there are still limitations here. But then again, if your money is not on a sound footing, which it's not at this point. Of course, part of this is because Mr. Jackson doesn't understand money. He's a farmer. He doesn't trust, he doesn't trust, he doesn't trust paper money. But Nicholas Biddle did. He knew how to control the amount of paper money per the gold and silver that had to be kept in reserve to back up that money. And that's what he was doing to prevent inflation, to present, prevent the upward swing of prices or the downward swing of prices. And after he's, and after he's been neutered, what happened to the economy? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so when you hear, and in fact, I was listening to Dr. Richard Wolf the other day. I don't know how many are familiar with Dr. Richard Wolf. He's a, an economist. He went to Yale University, taught at MIT. He now, he now teaches, in, I think he teaches at Columbia. He said he was, he was railing against uh, the, 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 the inequities of capitalism. And he's more or less a Marxist economist. Some of what he says is okay. Some of what he says, you know. Um, but, but part of that, I agree to a certain extent that sometimes when a, when a few make the decisions at the expense of the mass, what happens? They, they make these decisions for their, own, for their own good instead of everyone else's. I understand that. But there are, there are parts of capitalism which are okay. Should it be maybe regulated to a certain extent? Yes. But at the same time here, you are seeing though, because of this race for land, you know, again, John Adams, go back to what Adams said, you know, for a functioning system of representative government, the wide ownership of land is required. We have a lot of that. We have a lot of that. And as we're moving west, the businessman and the banker are going to follow the people. However, that Hamiltonian idea of, of, of industrialization and financialization is going to overtake the agrarians. And again, the agrarians, you know, again, I call the Civil War, go back to what I mentioned in that handout, I call the Civil War the revolt of the planters. That's basically what you're seeing here. But then again, when the, but again, they're wrong. You know, this idea of a southern aristocracy, you know, where the plantation owners run the Confederacy and everyone else is the second, third class, well, the second class are what? The small farmers, you know, the farmers are not the ones exporting. They're selling their grain and their livestock to the plantation owners. The plantation is the backbone of the southern economy, or if you want to call, one economist called this cotton capitalism. That's quite a term. Cotton capitalism? But again, you see here, when this war starts, you know, there are going to be people in the South that understand that this isn't going to work, primarily because of the fast pace of the Industrial Revolution, the evolution of capitalism. And this idea of an aristocracy, that's dying here. It's dying. The North is emblematic of how the world is going to be. Mass population, 
resources, industry, and finance. And interestingly enough, you know, it's that finance, you know, that the, the, the Southerners thought that if they withheld cotton from the British and the French, well, where else are they going to go to get cotton? Well, how about India? The British, the British have a colonial empire known as India. And that's going to backfire. By the time the Southerners come around 1862, what do you think the British, especially the British and the French, who do you think they're going to invest in? The North. And the North, and because of this, the North is only going to be able to finance the war 13% with the currency. The rest of it's going to be people investing in the U.S. government and financing that expansion to make weapons, train soldiers, as opposed to the South, which is going to have to rely on 60 to 65% of its financing is going to have to come from that Confederate currency. Now, how is that going to work? And you know, and unlike and unlike the North, perhaps the 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 the, 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 uh, the government in Richmond has to go around with the collection squads to take certain amount of grain and livestock from the farmers to feed that army they have to build. But of course, this leads to southern urbanization and industrialization because they have to make that military industrial complex to finance the war. Too little, too late. But after the war, it's important here. Industrialization in this country takes off. 144,000 factories in 1865, uh, 130, 335,000 by 1900. We produced $2 billion in industrial. 1960, 11 and a half billion by 1900. It goes up five and a half times. You see what's happened to the country? It's no longer true in 1900. Still half of the, half the American population lives on a farm. That's true. But you can tell here that that progression of industrialization, big finance is taking control of the country. And of course the penalty is going to be you're going to cut your colonial roots. And the more industrialization, the more finance you're going to have that's going to undermine the republic eventually. And you're going to see, and we're going to go into this next week, financial imperialism, you know, as the country grows and as it begins to produce more goods, it's believed that the population here cannot digest all those goods. So what do you have to do with them? Export. Yeah. And as you export, and as we begin to grow, you know, financial, financial power, we're going to begin to loan and open up branches of, you know, banking overseas. Does that lead to overseas interests? Yeah, of course it does. With the strength of the dollar being bolstered by what? This industrial monolith. By the mid-1890s, we are the world's ranking economic power. And what does that lead to? Financial power. And so if you have interest overseas, what has to follow to protect them? A navy and then an army. Isn't that what China's doing right now? Isn't China building a larger navy? Building and buying a larger navy? Yeah, of course it is. Why? Because they have numerous interests overseas. Do you know there's a million Chinese living in Africa? A million. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. And so to a certain respect, they're following, they're following the, the American model. You build your economy first, then the military. And so this idea of money, I mean, you can't have, you can't have a dominant power without access to money. It doesn't work. Nice to go into Vietnam, nice to be in Vietnam and have the peasant <laughs> form your army, but what happens after you win the war? Don't you have to have economic development? Yeah, you do. We seem to understand that. Sure, the farmer wants his land in 1776, 1780, and 1781, but by 1900, what's the story? Industrialization, financialization, so on and so forth. Because by this point, you know, it's no longer 
the common everyday Joe like yourself grabbing land across this, this, this great expanse. And now with the Spanish-American War, it's the Army and the Navy grabbing land overseas, not mom, pa, kettle. That's not how this is going to work. You know, it's changing. The country is changing. And industrialization and, and financialization is going to change it. It's going to change the politics. Is that going to run headlong into the Constitution and Bill of Rights? Oh, yeah. That's coming. And we're going to get into that. But next week, I'm going to get into this, 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 you know, this financial imperialism in places like Cuba, the Philippines. How about Nicaragua? You know, we're not doing anything any different here than what the British were trying to do at this point. Only we're going to overtake the British and the French. And I'm going to get into how this financial imperialism is bolstered by that 1914-1918 conflict. You know, and dollar diplomacy, this kind of thing. I mean, the power of the dollar... It's something, it really is. You know, I look at the, you know, I, you, I look at the dollar uh, at this point, and, you know, and, and I, you know, my, 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 my wife and my kids were talking about Star Wars and lightsabers. I said, lightsabers? It was nothing like the dollar. What do you mean? I said, who needed, who, you didn't need as many soldiers. Each dollar's a soldier. You know, why, why, why spend blood? You buy it. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Interesting, a country that couldn't, that, that was mired in debt is now virtually buying whatever it wants. Is that going to change the country? Of course it will. Well, uh, you know, <clears throat> when, when you, you know, we can out, we, we have a, a gross national product bigger than any European country. But if you put all the European, the major European countries together, well, their gross national product is larger than ours. Uh, of course, it's, uh, some of these economists are saying in the not-too-distant future here, the Chinese net gross national product is going to be bigger than ours. Um, but, you know, it's like any other empire. They never last. There's always a comeuppance here. And so, you know, when, and we'll get into this too. When you go back to 1944-45, Bretton Woods Agreement, I mean, the world has been torn up. How, how many knocks can the world take? You've had the 1914-18 conflict, the Depression, in between 1931 and 1945, or 1939-45, the Depression. How many knocks can the world take? And so, coming out of 45, who's the only game in town? So whose currency is going to have to try to float the world? Well, we're going, to get in, we're going to get into that as we go on here with the dollar. Uh, because, you know, some, some people say, what, what really backs the dollar today? F-16s, M M1 tanks, and, 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 uh, and aircraft carriers. Now, is that a way to base a currency? So, you know, it, th this shows you where the country has been going here perhaps. But, but again, when we come back next week, I'm going to get into this aspect of using the money. Uh, in a, if it's financial imperialism. And I got that title based off an article I read. Um, well, the title anyway. I mean, I'm doing a lot of reading on this stuff. There's a man by the name of Frederick C. Howe. And he wrote a book in 1906 called Confessions of a Monopolist. Yeah, it's an interesting book. And, you know, this is, and that's, and I'm going to get into some of this because that's an interesting period, the, the 1890s into the early 20th century, when you begin to see the rising power of Wall Street. And, you know, Rockefeller, the Morgan interests, and people like this. Uh, it's fascinating to see this and how, and how, you know, some of this money is going to be used uh, to finance the Nazis. Some of this money will wind up going to the Bolsheviks. I mean, the dollars is, to Wall Street, the dollar is as big as a bedspread. 
uh, which is understandable. They're in the business to make money. Okay. And so it's interesting, you know, when you, when you, when you go back and you read some of the old articles coming out of 1906, 1910, 1920, 1925, some of the people involved in this, what they're saying back then. And you're going back almost 100 years and in some respects over 100 years. Some of these people who were involved in this who knew the Rockefellers, the Morgans, so on and so forth. Or, or, people, like, um, or, or, or people like Owen Young and, and, and later, and, and later uh, Ger Gerard Swope of GE. I mean, GE was a major player here. Uh, GM is growing. It was growing in power in the 1920s. Political power. It's amazing to see the see the people who will support Franklin D. Roosevelt. And some of these were big money, like Bernard Baruch. Remember him? Yeah. And so you see where the country's going here with Wall Street. It's fascinating to see politically. It's fascinating, and we're going to get to that. So. Anybody else have any questions or, or, or comments? I mean, isn't that, isn't that what a, I mean, there are economists that will tell you a dollar represents what? Debt. I mean, isn't that why you print more money to create more debt? Now, what happens when that gets out of control? And we'll get into that too, because right now, being the world, the dollar is the world's reserve currency, and all these other countries have to keep your currency in their central bank tills, does that give us a license to produce more debt and have other people pay for it? Because what do you hear from politicians? Oh, we got to do something about the debt. Yeah, that debt perpetuates your power. You're going to get rid of the debt then? Wow. What a concept. What a concept. So it's so you got to be careful here, you know, depending on what politician you're listening to. I mean, I remember when uh, Ron Paul, Ron Paul was running, and, uh, and, 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 I, I, and I, which I found fascinating when they were both running for their perspective, uh, the perspect, nom, in, their, in their perspective party's nomination for the presidency. Ron Paul and Dennis Kucinich, right? And Ron Paul is saying, let me get this straight. You're borrowing money from China so you can go fight in Afghanistan. What is, what is, what is Dennis Kucinich saying? Let me get this straight. You're borrowing money from China so you can go fight in Afghanistan. Isn't one to the left, the other more to the right? Or they're both saying, gee whiz, uh, presidents don't go before Congress and ask for a declaration of war anymore. They're both saying this. So you're getting elements from the right and from the left saying the same thing. Of course, domestic politics are different, but I'm talking about foreign policy here with relation to money. Of course, what's going to happen to both of them? You know, the Republicans, after all, don't want it, Ron Paul. And what's going to happen to Kucinich? He's going to be gerrymandered out of office. Now, they don't want to hear those arguments. So it's, interest, it's interesting here when you take a look at somebody like Ron Paul and Dennis Kucinich. They're on either side of the, either side of the political equation here. And, and, and they're saying virtually the same thing. Fascinating. Yes. Well, that's based on what you're saying. If there is, you know, when people... When, I mean, that, that's going to happen. That's going to happen eventually. There are going to be countries that are not going to want to invest in the dollar anymore. So, if you're the type, you're you're making uh, seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year, and you got fifty thousand, fifteen thousand dollars in credit card debt, what do you think is going to happen to you? You're better off making only fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year and having a thousand dollars in credit card debt. And so, because what's going to happen if there's nobody investing in the dollar or, or fewer people investing in the dollar, uh, money's going to have to come out of the system uh, to, or, or, you know, you're not going to, you're going to see a lack of Medicare, Medicaid, education, Social Security. You're, that, that'll, that'll come. Has to come. Because the country's got to pay its debt. Well, in other words, 
you're going to have to devote more of your income to pay that debt. At the same time, you got credit card debt, which is why I've told my kids, if you got credit card debt, get rid of it. Pay it off now. I mean, if, if, if your credit card debt is like 2 or 3% or even 5% of your, of, of, of your assets, well, okay, you just write a check, you're done. But if, you're, if your credit card debt is like 10, 15, 20% of your assets, to me, that's a problem. Well, that's like, you know, talking about fudging money. Well, yeah, but at the same time, you know, Washington at one point gave banks like Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan and Chase the green light in the Caribbean to launder drug money. And guess where some of the profits for that went? Funding the military operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, what happened to Congress controlling the purse here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Some of those drug kingpins from Central and South America, their money was laundered here. And then some of the profits the banks made was used to, f to fund military operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. Well, you should be. Just a few years ago. During the Obama administration. And the Bush administration. Who knows what's going on with this one. And so, you know, I mean, this is the power of Wall Street. And so, you know, when you go back to the recent election and Trump is saying, well, Goldman Sachs is just a Hillary sat trap, yet when he took office, he had to take eight of them on. He has no choice or else he's out. That's simple. That, it's simple. Well, yeah, you're, you're getting next to nothing. I mean, I made a comment. I was in a, was a meeting the other day. I don't know. We were, they were talking about credit card debt and things of that nature. And I, you know, someone mentioned something, to, it was at a, it was at the East Newark Neighborhood Association, because we're fighting this building that's going up near the East Newark Railroad Station. And you know, somebody mentioned, well, you know, we pray hard enough. I said, are you kidding? I said, pray hard enough. I said, who are most of the presidents of your bankers, of these banks? They're Protestants, Catholics, and Jewish people, right? These are most of the presidents of your banks. And yet at the same time, uh, you know, those religions frown on excessive interest rates. You ever take a look at your credit card bill? You know. And so, you know, because I made that comment, I said, God? Yeah, gold, oil, and diamonds. <laughs> well, that's a hell of a thing to say. That's tough. Oh, so, you know, I mean, where, where have we gone? Well, we're going to get to that. Anyway, that's it. Thank you. Have a good evening.